evening's conversation um, hosted by Privacy International and the Migration Tech Monitor. Um, I'm pleased to say that this evening, um, Edin Amanovic, um, who is the advocacy director at Privacy International, um, which, as many of you will know, um, campaigns against governments and tech companies uh, which exploit data for, for power and profit. Um, I'm also joined um, this evening by Petra Molnar, who is um, the head of the Migration Tech Monitor, uh, a new organization um, that is uh, being active in this space, and she's going to tell us more about it this evening. Um, and Mary Atkinson, who is the campaigns officer at the Joint Council um, for the Welfare of Immigrants. We're going to begin this evening's uh, conversation with um, a, a presentation which is going to take us through um, the excellent report that Privacy International has put together um, on the UK's privatised migration surveillance regime. Um, there will be time for questions uh, to the panellists. Um, we're aiming to, to keep this um, within within the one hour um, from the from the beginning of the conversation so an hour from now um, but i will be inviting questions and some of you may already have um, emailed in questions um, so uh, we'll try to make sure that there is time i will ask the panelists um, to mute when they're not speaking please um, and just to advise um, that we will be recording this evening's um, conversation just so that everybody is aware. Um, and with that, I will hand over to um, Edin, who is going to take us, um, take us through some of the main findings. Thanks very much, Daniel. Um, so yeah, like Daniel says, we thought it'd be useful just to go through this report that we released last week. If you're anything like my colleagues, you've probably not spent the last week meticulously reading a 50 page PDF. So we thought it'd be useful to go through it. If you have, my apologies, you might be familiar with some of this. And um, so I'll just run through some of the more interesting takeaways. So as background privacy international um, campaigns are part of our work campaigns against the surveillance industry, which are companies ranging from huge arms and tech companies to smaller ones, selling things like hacking tools used to uh, infiltrate and exfiltrate data from devices to huge internet monitoring surveillance tools which extract data from internet networks at a nationwide scale and these companies are increasingly moving towards working with immigration agencies or selling types of data which are used by immigration agencies for example in assessing asylum claims or for finding people to deport in the US, there's been a fair amount of reporting on this, and we know a fair amount about how these agencies conduct surveillance and use data compared to the UK, and I think. So we're hoping to spend the next few years trying to better understand these systems in the UK, how this impacts on people subject to immigration control, and how we can improve some of the protections for them. So at this stage with the report, we've gone through some of the open source information that's out there, and we thought it'd be useful already to release this to a hopefully provide a guide to those people affected that might find it useful but more importantly for us so we can get feedback so we can understand from others out there and yourselves on this call as to what is and what isn't important really so in preparation for the report a lot of it involved me for example digging through ancient procurement documents around spending and a friend, I told a friend of mine this, and they were like, why are you digging through just obscure documents, which I think is a very fair question to ask. Um, but I have no shame in admitting that I'm really interested in surveillance. And also, as a refugee to the UK myself, I spent 10 years uh, subject to home office bureaucracy. Uh, and my experience was that they had constant screw ups and constant undue delays. So I'm just very interested in kind of looking underneath the bonnet of what these systems are and how they work. But I completely understand that they might not be of interest to everyone. So it'd be just really important for us if you could provide us with feedback as to what is interesting and what isn't. So basically the report covers four things. So first we outline some of the current home office agencies and the databases which they have access to. 
It then talks about some of the databases which are currently being developed. So the Home Office has a number of large IT projects where they're trying to develop what we're calling in the report back-end databases, which are really dull and boring at the moment, but they'll be used to facilitate surveillance capabilities years down the line. So it discusses them, and then it also discusses some of the surveillance tech and, and tools and sources of data which immigration enforcement have access to at the moment. So I thought we had an hour and a half, so I'm going to briefly cut down some of this segment, but I wanted to, I'll keep this one in. This is related to one of these databases, which is called the um, um, Digital Services at the Border, and it's important to outline. Um, it's a system where they're trying to essentially gather data on people uh, and goods that are coming into and out of the UK and then share that information with the Border Force Police and Intelligence Agencies. So, for example, when you're buying an airline ticket um, or providing information to an airliner, these companies have to provide that information to government agencies. And this project essentially wants to automate that process and find out who might be a threat and identify patterns and so on. I mention it because it's, I think, a symbol of what is really understood across government to be a history of IT failures at the Home Office. So this one, for example, uh, was initiated, comes from a project which was, which was initiated in 2003 called eBorders, which I had to scrap in 2015 without delivering large parts and having spent 830 million on it. So US arms company Raytheon had been contracted for the project, uh, but the Home Office claimed they weren't delivering and then tried to get out of the contract and it was subsequently sued by Raytheon and ended up having to pay that company 150 million pounds as a result and then spending an additional 300 million on upgrading old systems uh, that don't really work so as a result this new program digital services at the border which was projected to cost another 350 million is being carried out by other companies including BAE systems um, and it was supposed to end in 2019 but again has really failed to deliver and only delivering one small portion of it and now its deadline has been extended into next year. So while all of this has been going on, uh, obviously Brexit has happened and then the cabinet office stepped in and contracted a US surveillance company called Palantir, which is notorious in the US for working with ICE in facilitating deportations. Uh, and they're working on a very similar system which aims to track goods and people coming into and out of the borders. And again, the cabinet office is paying them millions in order to do that. The second database I want to talk about is called Immigration Platform Technologies, which began in 2014 and was supposed to finish in 2017. It's essentially a caseworking database. So if you're familiar with asylum casework in the UK, it's supposed to replace the case information database, the asylum support system and the biometric residence permit system. A previous attempt at replacing the case information database uh, under a program called Immigration Casework was closed in 2013, uh, having achieved much less than planned. So that was despite spending another 350 million on that system. What this meant was even though they had spent these hundreds of millions on that system, the Home Office staff were subsequently left relying on paper systems and this older one, which according to the National Audit Office, which kind of audits these large IT projects was error prone and had a history of freezing and being unusable. So last year it was revealed that this program where a number of large contractors are working on, some 98% of the staff working on it are temporary staff, meaning that just eight out of over 300 people that are working on the program are actually civil servants. And I think one of the issues here, and this is another something that's spelled out by the National Audit Office in their report, is that Home Office appears to always want to be squeezing in new capabilities and new tools into their systems, which really undermine their delivery. So, for example, one of the capabilities they wanted to squeeze into this program, uh, was, which is supposed to be really about casework management, is the ability to share people's immigration data with other departments. So in 2014, they had contracted with various firms to provide the early capability for departments. So outside of immigration enforcement to cross-check people's immigration data 
against the system and it's still in development known as the status check-in project. Yeah, well, so two other projects the Home Office is working on, I'll just do this quick, is uh, one related to biometrics and another one related to law enforcement data. So the goal here is they're trying to merge these two disparate uh, sources of biometric data. So biometrics is like fingerprints, facial data, DNA that are held in the main immigration and policing databases and have these uh, have the source of data more readily available to more government, what they call users. So YDOS, which is a huge US tech company, was contracted for 300 million to provide and merge these databases. So one that's provided by I IBM, which is immigration database, and the policing one, which is provided by Northrop Grumman. So the effect of this has already been seen, in particular with regards to roadside immigration checks that are carried out by the police. So this is a screenshot of a tweet put out by Surrey Police. So you can see here on the left, this is their mock-up of what they see on their screens. And if you zoom in on the right, that's the kind of thing that they're seeing on their screen. And they've named that person a naughty bear. But if you see circled, that's the link to the immigration database. So it's essentially by merging this data set, they've allowed more government agencies to have access to that. And that's really the risk because they're still at the start of this project. They're converging more data into more singular data sets and then wanting to add more and more government agencies to that. So really, once you have developed that capability, it will only be a matter of just a political decision as to what government agency gets access to it with the flick of a switch. It'll be that easy to, for example, add more government uh, agencies such as local councils to have access to more uh, data, for example, immigration data. So after the databases, the report covers the types of surveillance tools available to immigration enforcement and the border force. One of the increasingly common things we're seeing is the use of what's known as phone extracting tech. So this is software which you basically plug into a device which scans everything on it, including, for example, deleted messages and photos. On the picture on the left, this is like a real picture from a company called Celebrite that's based in Israel, which explicitly markets this software for that kind of surveillance, arguing that you could, for example, tell if an asylum seeker is actually a terrorist based on their phone data. And on the right, this is one of the receipts that are handed to people once immigration enforcement take their phone. At the moment, we know this happens, but we have no idea how common it is, how the data and what data they're collecting from it, how it's used, uh, how this might affect people's asylum applications and what protections there are in place. Other tools include, for example, uh, carbon dioxide detectors, heartbeat monitors, drones and UAVs. And we talk about the companies that are involved in supplying that. Other more novel tools, so for example, on the right here, this is like a data analytics system that they, you basically plug in all the intelligence that you have and it markets itself as trying to be able to find connections. Uh, long range cameras, and on the left here, this is like a covert camera that's stuck into a baby seat. So in addition to these tools, the immigration enforcement also have access to surveillance powers. So for example, hacking tools, which is basically an example of that is like malware, which would be installed on a device, which would then allow the user to extract all the data from it and do things like secretly take over the microphone or camera to just record everything that's around that. But we have no idea how often this is used and for what purposes by immigration enforcement. And they also have the power to request what's known as communications data from telco networks. So this is, for example, the who, what and where of the communications that you're sending to people uh, and location history. So we know that, for example, they've requested this data over 7000 times last year. And a UK company has also provided immigration enforcement with a tool that's used to intercept traffic uh, when somebody's connected to a Wi-Fi network. Another thing that started in 2016 was a new data sharing system called um, the Single Intelligence Platform, which centralizes 16 different data sources and essentially allows different 
bodies within immigration enforcement share intelligence amongst them. Another thing which is of particular interest is the um, use of what's known as data brokers. So these are like huge companies, for example, credit rating agencies that buy up data and trade it uh, that you can buy from their various uh, reasons. So for example, this is GB Group, which has received a few million from the Home Office, including immigration enforcement and markets ability to locate people based on their addresses and other data. So I'll try and wrap up there. In addition to this outline of the kind of databases and surveillance tools that the Home Office has access to, uh, we also talk about some of the international data sharing arrangements that the UK has. So with, for example, EU databases based on the Eurodac and with the US, so in fingerprint sharing with US and other international countries around the world, and how the UK Home Office facilitates other immigration agencies around the world by supplying them with equipment or training or financing to be able to better target people so that they can then either stop people migrating to the UK or share intelligence with the UK, which is a common practice we're seeing around the world. Um, we have like a number of concerns around this, but I'm running short of time. So hopefully we can discuss them um, after this session. But really, I think what's important here is we've just kind of outlined what the in open source information is. So we'd really like feedback as to what is and what isn't important. So if you think that it's more important to understand particular systems and how they work and to get more transparency, we'd really like to hear that. If a particular system is important to people that you work with, it might be of interest the corporate influence on policy making, given that many of these companies are embedded within the Home Office. They have meetings, they lobby them heavily. There's a revolving door between people and the leadership of government agencies, whether that's something that's of interest to people and really what's missing. So anything that you've come across that um, you think is of interest and something we can look into. And so like I say, we can discuss it after, but feel free to also just send me an email. Um, so like I say, it's something we'd really like to explore further. And I'll leave it there. Thanks very much, um, Edin. And we will have the opportunity um, as, as the conversation progresses to, to come back to um, some of the points that you raise. Um, but before we do that, uh, I'd like to introduce um, Mary, for, who's with JCWI. Um, Mary, if I could ask that you, just before you get underway, if you give us a, a kind of a, a quick introduction, there'll be a lot of people on this um, uh, on this event this evening who are very familiar with JCWI and um, some of the big wins that you've had recently, especially. Um, but if you could tell us a little bit about that, um, and then I will ask you to um, to respond a little bit to Ed, Edin and the report, um, but especially in, in the way that it intersects um, with your work as the campaigns officer. Thank you. Yeah, sure, of course. Thank you so much. And thanks, Edin, for that um, really illuminating and kind of terrifying presentation. Um, yeah, it's such a big piece of work. And I think it's um, come at a really important time as we're seeing, uh, yeah, it's a really important time to think about how, how this impacts on people and how, um, increasingly data-driven policies are having an impact on people's lives. Um, yeah, uh, introduce the organisation. Um, JCWI is a legal charity based in London. We do legal work with people who are all stages of the immigration system, so people who are currently undocumented, people who are going through the asylum process, um, and, yeah, uh, supporting people to access justice where otherwise they, they wouldn't be able to. Um, and... That work with clients informs a lot of our campaigning work. So the kind of issues that we see people coming up against in their daily lives and as they struggle to regularize their status, uh, uh, yeah, informs our lobbying and campaigning work with um, politicians and um, with grassroots organizations as well. So supporting people to, um, uh, to speak up about um, hostile immigration policies and bring, bring that kind of... Um, advocacy to parliament um yeah and i i think this this work is so important because it's um uh, to me a lot of what has just been described is absolutely key to the hostile environment um it's always been an agenda that is based on data sharing um that is kind of 
at the core of how the hostile environment works is data sharing between, for example, the NHS and the Home Office and, and vice versa. Um, and um, yeah, this this report shows how data is uh, is used in ways that many people don't know about um, to kind of to increase surveillance and to track people in, in many aspects of their everyday lives uh, with the aim of, uh, yeah, sort of pursuing the hostile environment. Um, and yeah, it really, to me, what stands out is the the massive reach that arms companies have into this, into the home office. Um, and uh, and also how many of the companies are very, um, very boring companies <laughs> um, that, that most of us would never have heard of. Um, and yeah, I think it is probably useful for me to talk a bit about um, how this actually impacts on people. Um, it can be very difficult with the hostile environment in general to have a sense of uh, the, the impact that it has on people's everyday lives um, if, if you're not subject to it. And uh, it's important to bear in mind that even if you're not subject to it, you 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 are in ways that you might not have thought of. So like um, even people who aren't subject to immigration control are stopped in the street by immigration enforcement at far, far higher numbers at rates than, than um, uh, yeah. So like one in five of the people who are stopped by immigration enforcement uh, are British citizens. Um, so people who aren't subject to immigration control because they, they can't be, um, but who nevertheless are subject to, to some form of the hostile environment. Um, yeah, so the hostile environment is is very much a tangible uh, process when we think about it. It's dozens of immigration raids every single day. It's bosses known that they can exploit workers who are undocumented because um, those workers, if they speak out, can be detained and removed while bosses will be let off of their fines because they collaborated with the Home Office. And and I think when we're thinking about this kind of more data-driven work um, that the Home Office is so much oriented towards at the moment, uh, that's it's far from intangible as well. So a mistake in, in the data that the Home Office holds on you could mean an immigration raid being ordered on your house, could mean you being detained and taken away from your family. Um, you know, there are cases of people being hounded by the Home Office for years because they have the same name as somebody who has a different immigration history. And as the immigration system becomes increasingly digital only, errors like those will haunt people in more and more aspects of their daily lives. Um, it, I always remember reading a report um, by the ICIBI, Independent Chief Inspector of Borders and Immigration, where the Home Office were were um, being told off for not have, for keeping the records of people who did have status, who did have like a correct form of leave, on their database of people who could be uh, vulnerable to enforcement action. Um, so they were understandably kind of upbraided for this and the response was well these people might at some point become undocumented and then we'll be able to do to to um sort of pursue immigration enforcement against them and that's kind of um yeah quite a a bullish response obviously and is worrying in in uh in what it says about the ways that they treat people's data and and how much they understand that immigration status for many many people is a, a really fragile thing, um, you know, having to pay thousands of pounds in immigration application fees every couple of years means that for many people maintaining status is basically just out of out of um, their financial scope. Um, and that's something that Home Office is clearly aware of, the, the fact that people slip in and between different types of status. Um, yeah, uh, I mean, there's more that I could say about the fact that the Home Office is aiming to become self-funding um, off the back of application fees, essentially. Um, but I think, yeah, what this what this report really shows is is where where the money goes, which is is to big big tech companies and big arm company armed companies, um, and where that money comes from is is from the application fees of people who who really struggle to to get them together and to maintain their status because of that. Um, I think I'll probably wrap it up there and uh, we can continue that conversation in the question section. 
Thanks a lot, Mary. There's some um, really good uh, points about just the, the, the many different levels of unfairness um, embedded in that. Um, next, um, I'd like to give the floor to, to, to Petra Molno. Um, Petra, um, among many other things, runs um, an important new venture, uh, the Migration Tech Monitor, um, which is bringing together um, academics, um, journalists, um, and um, creatives uh, in order to address some of the big issues um, of where tech meets um, migration. Um, Petra is by training a lawyer um, and uh, was previously in Mozilla and um, fellow at the European um, <clears throat> the, the Defense of Digital Rights, um, an all round interesting Canadian. Um, Petra, can you, um, I'd like if you would to just consider a little bit or unpack some of your thinking on the, the kind of the war on migration and the threat and risk narratives that, that sit underneath a lot of um, a lot of this spending. Um, it's really clear from Edin's work, and it's very present in in what in Mary's comments now, um, that a broader narrative um, of of threat and risk is at play here. Um, I wonder if you could share some of your thinking around that with us. Thank you so much for that generous introduction and thank you to Privacy International for inviting me to speak with you today. Uh, for me, an event like this sits really uh, dear to my heart because as, as Daniel said, by training, I am an immigration lawyer. I'm a relative newcomer to this digital rights technology space. And so a lot of the questions that we are going to be grappling with together today are ones that I grapple with every day. And what I want to do is just in my brief remarks, maybe unpack some of the broader trends that we've been noticing in terms of the why. Why is this allowed to happen? And what are some of the kind of motivating factors, both in the kind of increasing trends that we are seeing when it comes to whether you want to call it criminalization of migration or this kind of increasing framing around risk and fraud and, and turning certain communities into testing grounds for increasingly violent technological experiments. I mean, what really for me, what one of the clear takeaways from this wonderful new report by Privacy International is just how endemic these technologies are becoming, how normalized they are becoming. And again, trying to understand it from this broader ecosystem of this panopticon that we are all now embroiled in, we really are seeing this relationship between immigration, law enforcement, and the border industrial complex playing out in all of these ways that data is collected, operationalized, and used. Particularly for me, the, the really disturbing um, case study in the report was that of the status checking. And the fact, again, that the primacy, the idea is that the state has a right to determine where you slot yourself on this kind of rubric. And we see this play out in different ways across the European Union. You know, we have different rubrics for risk, for likelihood of terrorism, likelihood of lying at the border. All of these really problematic tropes are making their way into the way technology is playing out. And again, for me, as someone who's trying to unpack kind of the why, this increasingly inappropriate over-reliance on the private sector when it comes to these public-private partnerships that we are seeing playing out in a whole host of administrative decision making and, and kind of datafication, not just immigration. To me, really, it shows just how firmly embedded the priorities of the private sector and big tech are in this conversation. And really, I think that's where we need to ask these tough questions. Whose priorities really matter when it comes to what is funded, what we think about, and how we move forward when we try and unpack and critique some of these ways the tech technology is playing out. You know, for me, we in our work um, have been looking at, for example, automation, automated decision making, AI, and how it's making its way into a variety of different applications across a person's migration journey. And time and time again, we are seeing it play out in these really dubious, horrible ways, you know, to I'm sure a lot of you on the call, the eye border control infamous experiment now is, is a clear example of how certain priorities take precedence over others. Why are we innovating and creating these new so-called solutions that are once again putting certain communities at the sharp edges of this technological development? Why aren't we using all this sexy technology to root out racist border guards, for example? Well, because very clear priorities are at play when it comes to what technology is funded, what we're even allowed to imagine as possible in this space. And again, I think the context 
of the particular decision making and this kind of datafication is really important because we're talking about the border. We're talking about immigration decision making, which is already incredibly opaque and discretionary. I mean, for those of you who work with these communities, those of you who are lawyers, those of us who are part of the communities, we all know how discretionary the decision making in immigration already is. Very little oversight and accountability exists as it is. And now again, we are stretching the space even further and the implications are quite far reaching. And I think the Privacy International Report really highlights how broad the ramifications for people's lives and rights really are. It runs the gamut from privacy issues to discrimination and all sorts of other rights and fundamental rights that are impacted. But it kind of begs the question, you know, we are seeing this increasing rise in you know, the reliance on data, reliance on automation, and again, this kind of technological response to migration. And why, why is there such little governance and regulation in play? I mean, in a lot of my work, I, I argue that this is actually very deliberate because it's mapped onto lines of power in society, of course, and this is all historical. Certain communities, people on the move, refugees, asylum seekers, undocumented people have historically kind of been testing grounds for a variety of policies that then get played out on the rest of the population. And we are seeing this play out time and time again in this kind of datification and this, this increasing reliance on migration management technologies at and around the border. The communities that we work with already have little power to exercise their rights, let alone mechanisms of redress or even sometimes knowledge that this is even happening. And this is deliberate. This is done deliberately on part of the state to again, obfuscate decision-making, make it more difficult to follow a line of reasoning and then perhaps even mount a legal defense to this. And I think again, the, the deliberate nature of this kind of technological violence is something that we need to pay attention to. But what do we do about it? I know one of the ideas behind this meeting is to think about active solutions. How can we learn from each other? How can we figure out ways forward? And Again, perhaps, you know, not to center my own experience in all of this, but as someone who used to be an immigration lawyer, I know how few resources and capacity there exists in this sector. Sometimes the last thing you're thinking about is AI and tech when your client's getting deported tomorrow. But I think we all need to learn from each other and realize that these risks are really real and strengthen the capacity of the civil society sector and NGOs who are working with people with lived experience of migration, because this is really the new frontier of the issues that we, we will all be facing and already are facing. So I'm really heartened that we are having more and more of these conversations together. And, and I hope that this is the beginning of further idea sharing. And I really look forward to the questions that will hopefully come to us uh, in the Q&A. So I think I'll leave it there. Um, and I look forward to the discussion. Uh, thanks, thanks, Petra. Um, just to remind it to people who are following the discussion, um, do send in your questions over, over chat. Um, we're going to do one quick round and I'll ask the participants, uh, the panel, just to, um, to keep their responses to around three, four minutes. Um, they'll know, you'll know when the three, four minutes are up because you'll see me waving frantically in a small video window. Um, and then I'm going to come back to you first. Um, I, and, uh, a declaration of interest here. Um, I'm a journalist, um, and I think there's some of the some of the real problems here in, in picking up on a report like this um, occurred to me immediately from a journalistic standpoint, which is that um, a story for a journalistic story out of this um, uh, is out of the issues that come that stem from this report. A standard British journalism take um, on, on this tends to be, or a narrative that dominates in British journalism is that the immigration system is broken. You pointed out in your report, these easy tropes, that's a broken system. Um, nobody knows how many immigrants there are. And this, these kinds of narratives are emotive and they lend themselves really easily to, um, to popular forms of journalism in the UK. Um, the other kinds of stories essentially the most obvious ones would be the home office isn't very good at IT and it has broken IT systems. Um, so you have this kind of thing in which immigrants are dangerous and the home office um, at worst is a bit incompetent, doesn't really know what it's doing with IT systems. Um, 
I wonder if I could, because it's something that I come across in investigating this topic more broadly. Um, I've been beginning to understand that just because systems don't do, um, don't work in the way in which the, the vendors sold them um, to work and because they end up being more expensive, the benefits or the alleged benefits often don't exist or are unachievable, but the actual harms that come from the application of these systems can be real. Um, can you talk a little bit about potential harms that you see in the, in the work that you've, that, that you've been doing with the report? Um, and if you could tell journalists where to look, what would you want to point them towards? And you need to unmute. There we go. So I think a very kind of real harm is just the fact that people, for example, like asylum seekers are left um, waiting longer than ever to access vital services, to get their status updated. So the fact that all this is going on, all, for example, spending tens of millions and hundreds of millions on these systems without actually delivering anything for real people means that they have to wait longer than ever. And then these companies essentially, they use the guard of secrecy because we don't know uh, what the actual problems are, how they sold their systems, what kind of meetings they had in the background. So we can, as um, kind of democratic populace, assess what went wrong. And they use that guard of secrecy so that essentially the problem becomes this narrative that there's just too many people, whereas the problem has actually become the fact that there's a culture of mismanagement at the Home Office that's been taken advantage of by these huge contractors. So the narrative at the moment is very susceptible to being securitized. So there are these people, there are threats, so therefore we need technology to deal with these threats. And that's almost become ingrained within the national conversation. And the issue fundamentally comes down to this lack of transparency and, sec and the secrecy surrounding this entire ecosystem, because journalists aren't able to tell the actual narrative, the factual narrative, um, which is out there. So obviously, I think one thing as an activist that's important is to get down, drill down to these details, try and find out as much as we can, put that information out there, work with people who work with migrant communities, work with solicitors who have an understanding of how this affects them to help guide our research, and then work with actual people who are affected by the issues to then get that to journalists. Because at the moment, like I say, that narrative is complete, completely uh, been securitized. So um, I think it's events like this, it's more kind of research, more different groups of actors around the UK working together, learning, for example, from communities in the US who have done a somewhat better job of holding um, companies accountable, of highlighting some of the abuses by, intel by immigration agencies than they have in Europe, where we, for some reason, focused less on that, I think. Thanks, Edin. Um, Mary, I'm going to turn to you um, next, and I'd like to focus as much of the rest of the conversation as I can on what to do with with the research and with some of the questions that it raises, because I think on the call we, um, I'm calling it a call, sorry, I'm not sure whether we'd allow to, it's a, it's a call, it's an event, it's uh, a conversation. Um, I'd like to, I think we probably have with us journalists, um, other um, civil society actors, lawyers and others. So do you want to get as many perspectives as possible? What to do in answer to some of the questions that, that come up in this conversation and some of the, the research that's contained in this report? Um, JCWI um, was very much in the headlines um, last year with a successful challenge to, to, to the streaming tool and with a, with a win on, on um, demonstrating discriminatory uh, practice in, in, um, in the main visa application tool that was used in the UK. Um, from JCWI's point of view, what, what would you pick up and try to um, act on from this? And what do you see as a kind of agenda for action from, from work like this? Thank you. Yeah, um, I think um, when we're thinking about what to do with this, which is like the most important outcome of all of this research and kind of 
what we'd all we'd all want our work to to become something tangible right um i think um yeah there are many ways that we can go about um about putting some of this stuff into practice um and i think the thing that jumps out at me from what ed has just been saying is that um a lot of it is about um about creating new alliances um uh, that maybe we aren't the ones that we are used to working in um so the one that jumps out to me right now is like the one that we're forging at the moment which is between the migration sector and the kind of privacy and surveillance uh sector um and because that's that's exactly where this work sits um and not so much about it's very difficult to think about like tackling the grand narratives um which is something that many of us here I think try to do in our work uh in different ways and it's obviously kind of like that's a years or decades long project but I think kind of drawing out the ways in which Petra I think for example mentioned that lots of this stuff is used firstly on migrant communities and asylum seeking communities as a testing ground for being rolled out to, across across the board, um, and that's something that we can kind of try to bring out in our in our work on this. Um, you mentioned the the streaming case, uh, and I'll just talk briefly about that because obviously uh, it's something that is yeah very difficult to do, um, but but which lots of people can be part of in different ways. Um, so the, the case, uh, yeah, successfully stopped the Home Office using uh, a streaming tool which um, kind of rated visa applicants even before any of their evidence had been kind of um, properly assessed, but, but rated them, um, gave them sort of like a flagged rating based on their nationality alone. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, it was really, really that that case was successful. I think the kind of the the message that comes from that which is what we need to tell people is that the the datification of migration if you like um does not uh divorce it from its the racism which is at its heart um it actually increases it so uh you, you know it just means that you can automatically make a racist decision rather than having to like have a human look at it and make a racist decision um so i think that's kind of like uh yeah the the key message for me is that um uh algorithms are not innocent because algorithms are made by people um which is uh yeah kind of the takeaway for me um and then i think obviously like you know taking the home office to court is a, a very expensive and risky undertaking um so it's important to think about like the things that we as normal people can do um about this uh there's been mention of journalists and i think it's there's a lot of there's a lot of material in this for for journalists to look into um of course as with a lot of uh a lot of kind of the direction of government and especially the home office towards outsourcing everything um in this case as well it makes it difficult for journalists to kind of really dig into for for example through freedom of information law because a lot of that stuff is just um not uh, accessible or can't be disclosed under foi um but there's still lots of interesting stuff like a lot of this stuff is just uh accessible through other means companies house like um uh, conservative party donation registers um you know that that stuff a lot of that stuff is out there to be found um and i think this report is is just a really great springboard for anyone who is interested in in finding out a bit more about that stuff through creative means thanks mary um petra i'm going to come to you for a, a, a quick question and then i'm going to start to go to some of the questions that have been coming in just a reminder to people joining now that if you'd like to put a question to any of the panelists or um, just a general question, then we can get the panel to volunteer an answer. Um, just add it into the uh, into the chat um, on Zoom. Um, Petra, because this is uh, it, obviously bearing in mind that the starting point for this discussion is is a report about the UK. Um, just before we get into the into the weeds a little bit in the UK. 
I'm, can, you, can you tell us whether or the extent to which you found um, things which are familiar from um, observation of the meeting point of migration and technology outside the UK as well? Um, I, just for those who, um, um, who wouldn't know this, um, Petra was uh, previously in, in Canada and produced an excellent report there um, called Bots at the Gate, which looked um, at uh, automated decision making um, systems that were um, encroaching into asylum decisions um, in Canada's system. Um, but you've been on a bit of a, a road tour since then of, um, of the whole dystopia. Um, if you could give us um, some quick notes from that trip. Thank you, Daniel. And yeah, that trip is just beginning and it's one that we are taking together at the Migration and Technology Monitor. Um, I mean, definitely, I think it's an important question because I think we need to understand this from a global perspective and regional specificity and, and understanding the way this is playing out in, in specific jurisdictions is really important, particularly because that's where the ramifications on indiv individual lives and communities are happening. But you're absolutely right. I mean, it is this kind of dizzying panopticon of international experiments when it comes to migration management technology. And, and unfortunately, the technology travels very easily, right? It might be developed in one jurisdiction, sold to another one, repurposed in a third one. And that is something that we're trying to understand. How does this actually function as a global project of control over communities that are already made marginalized? Uh, as Daniel mentioned, yeah, my beginning into this work started with Canada and completely by accident. Um, and then since then, I've been trying to understand how some of these technologies are playing out in Greece, where I'm currently uh, in other parts of the European Union. Uh, but also, as our migration and technology monitor moves forward, we really want to foreground geographic and, and other uh, substantive areas that are not really talked about or rather not given the opportunity to be talked about uh, in these spaces. I mean, there's a lot happening in the Middle East and Sub-Saharan Africa more testing grounds that are even more opaque and discretionary and difficult to, to unearth. But really for, for me, what's most overwhelming about this is the global nature of it and just how difficult it is for all of us working together to get a sense of how far reaching the problem is. And, and if anything, and I don't wanna preempt a question that popped up in the chat, but I think there is this moment now where things are moving at a much more accelerated rate and I'm also curious to see how this will all play out in the next, let's say, five to 10 years to come. Because if, if the last couple of years are any indication, I think we are in for a wild ride, globally speaking. Um, thanks, Petra. And we'll, um, we'll come back to that. And um, I'd like, first of all, to pick up a question from Retta Moran, um, who wanted to, to see if any of the panel could speak to, um, to this issue. It, it's, it's a fairly, fairly common assertion that they're, um, that's made by authorities that there's a, a strict firewall between health and immigration. So essentially it's safe for people um, to go and be vaccinated um, or to, to seek medical treatment um, without risking um, uh, potential um, immigration, um, immigration checks. Um, Mary, I suspect this is probably a, a quest, the kind of question that JCWI um, uh, would be well placed to, to answer. Sorry. Um, yes. So I think, I mean, I, it, yeah, I'm just going to be honest and say it's not like the area of my most major expertise, but um, I think in terms of, yeah, for example, of what we're seeing now with people being encouraged to come forward and get vaccinated after years and years of being told by the government, by healthcare agencies and by their own communities that they cannot come forward and access any kind of healthcare because they it will have negative immigration consequences for them. Um, I think it doesn't, you know, for those people, it doesn't matter how porous or not the firewall is, like the the existence of a firewall at all is like uh, inconsequential um, because the fear that is so entrenched in those communities means that um, the firewall doesn't exist. Um, but in terms of demonstrating how how porous or not the firewall is I think it's difficult to say because there are so many instances like with the with the example of healthcare there are so many different ways in which uh, data has and has been and is still shared um, whether that's about like people's debts that they recruit with 
different trusts um, or whether that's kind of like uh, we've seen examples of people's uh, like the the consultations they've had with therapists and, and psychotherapists being shared with the home office, um, which is obviously like a breach of trust and data of like the highest order. Um, so I think uh, in terms of how the thing is, a lot of people working within different agencies think that they should be reporting people. Um, and so like actually making a firewall happen is is very complicated because like, uh, you know, when when data can be shared, it will be shared by some people. So like, for example, with the police, that they aren't obligated to share data with the Home Office, for example, with people who come forward as victims or witnesses of crime, um, but they can, and so they do. Nope. Um, yeah. Um, but in answer to your question, Retta, um, I don't really have one, um, I'm afraid. Yeah, the conference. Um, I think uh, whoever's signed in as W, if you wouldn't mind muting yourself, please. Um, um, thanks, Mary, on that one. Um, it's, it's a hard question to answer definitively. Um, but I'd like to move on to um, a point that Martina Tazzioli um, raises, um, and it was one of one of the disturbing bits. I mean, there are many disturbing bits that kind of float up from from the report, um, not least the euphemism um, that they use for hacking of um, what is it now equipment interference. Um, but uh, the idea of intercepting Wi-Fi um, and the mobile phone extraction. Um, uh, if you could talk to us in a little bit more detail about that, um, and I, th I think uh, it's clear from Martina's question that, that she's also concerned for what that means for, for asylum seekers who are currently um, in the barracks and are speaking about having their own digital communications um, potentially intercepted. Yes, so just to say one important thing whenever we're kind of speaking about surveillance is not to make people feel that just because a capability exists that they themselves are under surveillance because it causes a lot of trauma and stress and may actually undermine their ability to actually use their devices. Um, with WhatsApp, to the best of our knowledge, it's end-to-end -end encrypted. So WhatsApp itself wouldn't have access to it. Um, the Wi-Fi analysis tool wouldn't be able to access it. The only way to do that is to hack into the device itself, which would, for example, require installing malware into the device, which if they go through the correct procedure in the UK would require a warrant with a judicial check. So you would hope that there was some level of control over that um, and a strong, reasonable suspicion of an offence. Um, a serious offence to allow that to happen. When it comes, the other way they could do it is through the extraction tool, but they would need actual physical access to the device itself. In that case, different police agencies and different uh, government agencies have different laws which govern under what circumstances they use that technology. So there's no UK guidelines, so some of them need warrants, some of them don't. Um, sorry, none of them need warrants, but some of them need different layers of approval. Um, so it'd be one of those two things if, if a client's concerned about their WhatsApp status, uh, their WhatsApp conversations being hacked, both of which are quite rare. You would hope they're kind of kept for serious offences unless it's the mobile phone extraction one. Um, thanks, Eddie. Um, I'll move next to um, a question from Daniel Asprong. Um, and Petra, I'm going to um, address this one to you. You, you began to answer it um, in the form of cheating in your in your previous um, in your previous comments. But um, you were talking. You're beginning to talk about a period of acceleration that we're all um, living through at the moment. Um, and Daniel raises the um, the good point that uh, will we look back on this period and think about it as a as a as a a turning point in the history of state justification um, for surveillance and intervention. Um, what are your what are your thoughts um, early in twenty one on that? 
Thank you for allowing me to usurp that question. <laughs> Thank you for posing it. Uh, I mean, I think it's an important one because uh, as we are all caught in this global moment, um, we've definitely been seeing an increase of these justifications around, well, you know, of course, we all want the pandemic to come to an end, but at what cost? And very early on, I mean, we're talking like March, April of 2020, um, we started noticing this kind of discourse formation that very strongly linked border enforcement and COVID management together. For those of you who are interested in Frontex press releases, and you know Frontex has been in the news a lot lately, but even back then, um, just reading through the kind of messaging around the way that the agency was positioning itself was so fascinating because they were making a really clear linkage between like, we are your one-stop shop, both for border enforcement and also for COVID-19. And that's such an interesting and really problematic conflation because I think as Daniel's question really cogently points out, this really plays up the historical narratives of migrants, refugees, people on the move, being tied to these really damaging tropes of bringing in disease and illness and having to be controlled and managed. And now look, we have all these sexy new tools to do it with, and also a global pandemic. You know, it's all very convenient. And unfortunately, we are seeing this playing out, this kind of normalization of surveillance, normalization of collection of data. And, you know, I'm not saying that perhaps there are legitimate ways to move forward and get us out of this pandemic moment. But the concern is that in this particular uh, context that we're talking about, border enforcement, immigration decision making, unfortunately, the pandemic is already being weaponized as a way to push a lot of these things forward. And, and I mean, even just on the ground, I mean, in a place like Greece, COVID has been weaponized as a way to, for example, not allow people to leave certain refugee camps, which, you know, is, is a very kind of direct way that the pandemic has been playing out. But in these more kind of ideas around the symbolism and the discourse and therefore the new policymaking and the, again, the priorities in terms of what gets funded, what gets thought about, it really is unfortunately, I think, accelerating this kind of power differential that is so inherent in this space. What we do about it, I'm not so sure, but <laughs> I am definitely noticing this trend in my own work. Thanks, Petra. Um, I'm going to give a, just a quick um, 90 seconds, please, to each of the panelists, just to make a, a final point. It could be a campaign from JCWI that you'd like to direct our attention to, um, a final takeaway from the report, um, Edin, or a, a quick thought, um, Petra, or any anything in those orders. But I'll come to you first, Edin. Yeah, I, th I think, um, I mean, you'll know yourself as a journalist, Daniel, what matters to people is human stories. So it's all very well just reading technical documents and talking about databases and surveillance systems. People react emotionally and care about things because they're emotions to people. So if anyone does come across these systems, people who are impacted by them, people that might be impacted by a system but you don't know what it is, then please do get in touch with us because it's really the only way you have of um, interesting journalists, of trying to influence policymakers, of influencing the public, is by highlighting the effects of these systems and giving human stories. I, I definitely second that. Um, and it's really important to try and find, um, find flesh and blood um, examples of, of the harms that people end up experiencing and living there. Um, Mary. Yeah, I think that's, um, yeah, the most important thing that I would highlight as well. And just to kind of follow on from that, I think that really any story of somebody who's been impacted by the hostile environment, if you if you dig into it, this stuff will be behind it. It's just, um, it, it's you know, this stuff isn't new. Um, the ways that people are already being impacted by the hostile environment, that's all down to, to the data sharing, to the data-driven nature of Hamas policy uh, making. At the moment so i think that like uh that those stories thankfully of uh well not thankfully but you know people are kind of uh being supported to share stories of the ways in which they've been impacted and i think if if a journalist or a campaigner's um interest is in how how home office's surveillance and data use uh, has brought that about. Um, that that's something that you can kind of bring out in the ways that you um, 
in the ways that you report that story. Um, and I think in just quickly in terms of the ways, you know, there's lots of different ways that we are supporting people to to resist a hostile environment in general. Um, and I can we've got a whole toolkit of things that people can do, one of which is to research these companies and, and talk about uh, or, or think about the ways that those companies are uh, embedded in their everyday lives. You know, the mighties, the um, uh, circos of this world, um, which do very, very boring things and very everyday things and very kind of life altering things uh, at the same time. Um, so I would urge people to check that out. And just quickly, um, for anyone who's interested in the ways, uh, Eden mentioned the the database that's being merged between law enforcement and immigration enforcement, which is kind of one of the one of the Home Office's key data projects at the moment. Um, and that is already impacting on people um, in the form of being stopped by police and having their um, fingerprints scanned um, and those fingerprints scanned uh, in both law enforcement and Home Office immigration enforcement databases, uh, which unfortunately, yeah, will kind of entrench racism of uh, the existing stop and search um, system and if anyone wants to know more about that they should check out the racial justice network which is based in Yorkshire and is doing some really great work on that um, so just a little plug for that. Thanks for doing that and do leave the details of that in the chat because it's easy for people then to copy paste. I'm going to um, offend Petra and abuse my office by um, picking up Eve Speakerman's question which has just come in um, Eve raises a really interesting point here um, about whether it's the right tactic to maybe borrow um, campaigning um, approaches that have been successful um, on, um, on fossil fuels, um, so divestment, uh, name and shame big corporations, um, and then use that as the base for activism. Um, I would say that in this space, this approach has been tried. Um, no Tech for Tyrants um, in the US um, had a, a quite a successful campaign embarrassing Amazon. Um, Amazon Web Services are um, the cloud service of choice for Palantir and, the, and therefore provide a lot of the technological capacity that's then turned into deportation operations for ICE in the US. Um, so that has been a fruitful tactic there. Um, I do think it would be wrong to think of that as an exclusive tactic, but anyone who'd like to talk further about that, Eva's been, Eva has been kind enough to put um, her email for contact um, into the chat. Um, I do think uh, a recording of this, just in answer to, to Well Nasser, it will, be, um, will be available. Um, but for now, we have kept relatively close to the timing we set out to do. So um, what I'd like to do firstly is to say thanks to the panelists. That's Mary Atkinson from JCWI, Edin Omanovic um, from Privacy International, um, and Petra Molnar from Migration Tech Monitor and Refugee Law Lab. Um, thanks to Privacy International for um, hosting the call. Um, thanks to everyone um, who turned up this evening, um, or as the Home Office would call you, customers. Um, I would strongly recommend um, that you read the Privacy International um, report. It's a really excellent starting point for some, for some critical thinking around there. Um, just a quick scan through the list of companies involved. Um, a lot of the companies are the kinds of things that you might expect to produce a laptop or to have manufactured your printer. Um, some of them are more recognizable as terrifying gigantic arms um, conglomerates. Um, and there's a bit of everything else in between. Um, so there's something for everyone there. Um, please do check out the chat just before we close things down because there've been some um, excellent contributions there and there's some opportunities to do a little bit of networking and connect. Um, there's also links to many of the reports that have been referenced this evening. Um, for now, thanks to everyone um, for joining and yeah, have a good afternoon or evening, um, depending on what time it is where you're following this. Thanks very much.